On this edition of the Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder and Elisa Morgan and Daniel Ryan Day and Rasul Berry are back at the table for a Bible study called Four Men, Four Stories. In the portion we're going to look at together during these sessions, there are going to be four people, and it's in the little book of Third John. And if you don't know where it is, Go all the way back to Revelation and then start moving backwards past Jude and to the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we're going to be looking at 3rd John. (laughs) And, you know, it's funny because you could miss it. It's just one page in your whole Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of my favorites when I used to do Bible reading plans because it was like, man, I could get a whole book checked off. Yeah, Yeah. 15 (laughs) verses. And you've covered one of the books of the Bible. In fact, we're going to read the whole thing in just a moment. Read an entire book of the Bible. And so who are the four men? What are their stories? Uh, What is this letter about? And why is its message important to us today? Well, that and more is what we'll discover as we explore four men, four stories in 3 John on the Discover the Word podcast. And it is great to have you with us for Discover the Word, the small group Bible study in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And it is Bill who is leading the conversation with Elisa and Daniel and Rasul in this episode. And earlier in the year, back in May, I think it was, Daniel led a helpful study of 1 John, the first of John's letters toward the back of the New Testament. If you missed that, I'd encourage you to look in the archive section of our website at discovertheword.org for that study of 1 John. And then in July, we had an interesting conversation with our friend Randy Richards about letter writing in the ancient world. It focused mainly on Paul, but I think you'll find that study helpful in understanding John's letters too. Uh, They'll refer to that in this conversation. And so if you didn't catch that one, it's called Paul the Letter Writer, and you can look for it in our archives as well. All right, but now let's get rolling on Four Men, Four Stories in 3 John. One of the things we talk a lot about here on Discover the Word is how you read the Bible. And that seems like a simple thing. You just, you know, you look at it and you read it, but we all bring a framework of how we read it and how we understand it and how we process it. So what I would ask is not just how do you read the Bible, but what are some ways that you know of, of how people read the Bible? Well, I grew up reading it as a rule book Mm. where we got very clear instructions about what right living looks like and how to keep God happy and and things like that. Whether or not the leaders in my life meant for me to hear it that way, (laughs) that's how I definitely read it. And it put a lot of pressure on and reading the scriptures felt like a burden, but it also felt good when I felt like I got it right. (laughs) Mm. What comes to my mind is how much Discover the Word has changed how I read the Bible, you know, and how life has changed how I read the Bible. Um, My tendency as a young Christian in my teens was to read the Bible almost like a Ouija board. You know, it's like I was looking for God to speak to me always. You know, it was all about me. It was all about what he wanted to say to me, his will for my life, his leading for my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I've aged and as I've learned more, you you know, I learned to read it more with the we in the context, you know, that this is God's words to his people, not just me. I mean, I'm important, but I'm no more important than anybody else. And I need to get into the flow of what his message is about and see it as a global message for all people everywhere. Good. Yeah, I also can agree that being a part of Discover the Word has kind of helped create some different nuances. I think growing up, I pretty much saw it as a textbook, I guess Mm. you could say, like Mm. this is kind of God's curriculum to Mm -hmm. tell me how to live and what to do. Mm. I think as I've grown in the faith with understandings of the various genres of literature and the truth that I wasn't the primary audience, the initial (laughs) audience, right? Like oftentimes reading conversations or correspondence between folks that 
is divinely inspired and has impact for me, but I am peering into a conversation mm. that was addressed to somebody else. And at that, especially with the letters part of the Bible wrestle, you're only getting half of the conversation. Yep. I'll throw a couple of others in there. I've heard the Bible referred to as an instruction manual mm-hmm. for life. So if you want to have a happy marriage, you can find five steps to a happy marriage. I even once sadly heard it referred to as five easy steps to a happy marriage. Which, <laughs> Where are those listed, Bill? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, second hesitations. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that I remember hearing B-I-B-L-E, right? Basic oh, yeah. instructions before leaving earth. Yeah. So. <laughs> there may be a granule of truth in some of those ideas. There are ideas in the Bible that can help us in our marriages mm-hmm. or can help us in our work life or help us in how we relate to people. There are things in the Bible, like a textbook, that tell us what makes for sound doctrine. But primarily, the Bible is not an instruction manual or a rule book or a theological textbook. It is a story, and it's actually not just a story. It's a unified story. It's one story that is supported by a variety of other stories. And we want to look at a portion of Scripture in our conversations this time where we're going to see different people as they come into play in this one unified story. And I think we tend to focus on the big-name characters like David or Moses or Peter, but there are others in the Bible who have stories to tell as well, like Dorcas in the book of Acts or like Barnabas, the son of encouragement, their stories contribute to the story as well. And I think the fact that God has given us a collection of stories to communicate his story Mm -hmm. helps us to understand how important people are to him because there are people in these stories. Mm -hmm. And I I love how you brought out the kind of secondary figures, if you will, you know, Mm -hmm. the more hidden figures, because their stories are just vital. I mean, you showed us when we did a series on Lydia and her stories woven through a couple of different of Mm -hmm. the New Testament books. It's pops that way. And we forget about them. And I think that's also what invites us to see ourselves in the stories at times, because if that was true for those people, then we kind of believe that God cares about our stories as well and that he meets us in our stories and walks with us through our stories. Yeah. Yeah. People relate to people more than they relate to abstract concepts. And Mm -hmm. when I first really discovered that was when I started doing international Bible conferences for our Daily Bread Ministries. The first couple of them we tried to do were really heavily theologically oriented. There was a lot of good information, a lot of good data in there, but there wasn't a real solid connection point. When we started telling the stories of Bible characters, whether great or small or known or unknown, people really tended to perk up and pay attention because somehow they could see themselves in that person's story. Mm. In the portion we're going to look at together during these sessions, there are going to be four people, and it's in the little book of 3 John. And if you don't know where it is, go all the way back to Revelation and then start moving backwards (laughs) past Jude and to the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we're going to be looking at 3rd John together this week. And I thought just to start off, it might be good if we read the entire letter in one sitting, all 15 (laughs) verses. (laughs) Ooh. (laughs) And you know, it's funny because you could miss it. It's just one page in your whole Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of my favorites when I used to do Bible reading plans. Because it was like, man, I could get a whole book checked off instead of just a chapter or two. (laughs) Well, let's look at it and let's just go around and read a few verses. And uh, Elisa, if you'll start, and then Rasul, if you'll pick up, and Daniel, then you, and then I'll finish with the last couple. So let's take a look at this little book. All righty. 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men 
so that we may be fellow workers in the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Verse 13, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Now, Daniel and Elisa, you weren't with us for this, Rasul, but I want you to think back to when we had Randy Richards come in and talk with us about New Testament letter writing. <laughs> what did he tell us about letters in the New Testament as opposed to common letters in the New Testament era? Well, bottom line, the common letters in the era were much, much shorter than the yeah. ones we have in mm -hmm. our scriptures. And this one is short, we think, but it actually yeah. is a little <laughs> bit longer than the normal letter. Yeah, the average letter in the first century was 87 words. And Third John is 219 words, so that's almost triple, and yet it's the shortest letter that we have. One of the things about this particular letter that we'll get into is that it gives us a really good insight into the workings of the Christian community in the early church and, and gives us some ideas about how things went not so well or so well. We started off by saying there are four characters in this story. Did you pick out who they were as we read through? The elder. Yeah. John himself, yeah. Yeah. And then Gaius, who was the beloved, which is a favorite word of John's. Yeah. 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 He uses that word a lot in his mm -hmm. letters. And then who else did we have? The two Ds. Diotrephus and Demetrius. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that we're going to find as we work our way through this little letter is that John seems to be very adept at what Paul challenged us to in Ephesians 4 when he said to speak the truth in love. <laughs> and I think all of us would agree that that's a tough balance to strike. Yeah. The balance between truth and love or grace and truth. But we're going to see how he... When necessary, he brings truth, but whenever possible, he offers love. And I think that's a good balance for us to kind of have in the back of our minds as we work through this little letter together. All right, good start to our study of 3 John in this edition of the Discover the Word podcast. Shortest book in the Bible just slightly shorter than 2 John and Philemon, which rank 2 and 3 on the short list. That's why we could read the whole thing in that segment, setting up our look at four men, four stories, and how they will help us understand the message of this letter that we call Third John. So now we'll spend the rest of this episode talking about those four characters, and we'll begin with the person who wrote the letter, the Apostle John. And Actually, he doesn't give us his name in the letter. He does call himself the Elder. And so as the group was getting ready to record this segment, uh, we got talking about names. And I'm not sure how, but we got onto the subject of middle names. Seems like that's always kind of an interesting discussion to get into with a group. And I started by telling them my middle name is Dale. And here's where the conversation went from there. Dale? Yeah. <laughs> D-A-L-E? <laughs> I feel okay. called to invite you to embrace God's love for you by calling you Dale from now on. <laughs> you got nothing to complain of. You know what Evan's middle name is? Crystal. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never guessed that one. It's Evan yeah. C. Morgan. It's C-H-R-I-S-T-A-L. It's his mother's maiden name. So he's Evan C. I don't feel near as bad about my middle name now. I, uh, my middle name's Earl. Yeah, I like that. Earl and Dale. This is awesome. Okay, what's yours, Russell? I have two. Amin Akbar. Do you like him? Uh, no. Yeah. Um, wow, so you have the full phrase as a name almost, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Rasul Amin Akbar yeah. is messenger of great truth. Huh. 
Yeah. You can't like that. <laughs> I mean, I like what it means. And yeah. I feel like, you know, God <laughs> just, definitely just... had a plan. But yeah, my brother would tease me about it mm. um, <laughs> growing up. Mm-hmm. His middle name was Theodore. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and what's yeah. yours? Dang. Or the fact that mom only uses it when you're in trouble. Oh, yours Daniel is, Ryan. Yours is Dayton Ryan. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, yeah. mine's just Ryan. Okay, y'all have to ask me. Yes, what is yours? Okay, you ready? Okay, do you know what my maiden name was? No. Lee. Good job. Okay, Elisa Lee. My middle name is Thompson. <laughs> Elisa Thompson Lee Morgan. I sound like a law firm, don't I? Elisa <laughs> Thompson Lee Morgan. Yeah, it was my mom's maiden name. Yeah. So you and Evan, both your mother's maiden, maiden name mm-hmm. became your middle name. Mm-hmm. I've never yeah. heard of that before. Oh, you like, haven't? Oh, no. no I mean, we named common. our daughter Eva I've Lee seen hyphenated Morgan. last names, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. where the person yeah. will use their mother's maiden sure. name. And, but I'm not, I didn't, I mean, I guess people do that as a Yeah, they do. Name, but. Yeah. yeah. In the South, there yeah. was a period of time where that happened a lot. My mom's name was Muriel Overton johnson love it and then she got married and added the crowder yeah. uh, but overton hmm. was a family name kind yeah. of a uh, thing. right because that makes uh, it easier for, especially yeah. to track family trees it and, does yeah. got it okay. okay now we're going to talk about the writer with no name <laughs> <laughs> after all that talk about names wow <laughs> okay you ready bry i mean dale When you're reading through the Gospels and you see the 12 apostles, is there any one of the 12 disciples of Jesus that you particularly relate to or identify with? And, and maybe it wasn't one of the 12, but maybe it's one of the other followers of Jesus, because we know that there were many who followed him. Who do you particularly identify with or do you? I think hmm. it kind of depends. Sometimes I feel like Peter when I step in it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> other times I've found myself feeling like, is it the sons of Zebedee that ask Jesus, when you get into your kingdom, you yeah. want to be leaders, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Sit at your uh, right and left. Yeah. Me, yeah, me, me. So it yeah. kind of depends. <laughs> Probably on a just superficial level, when I first read the story of Zacchaeus, because I was the shortest <laughs> in my <laughs> class uh, growing up. <laughs> so the idea of climbing up to having to see things, that was, that was my plot in life. And I also appreciated his dramatic conversion and desire to make things right with yeah. people after mm. he you know, had sinned against them. I got to confess, I have a hard time remembering the specific 12, all yeah. of them. You know, I have yeah. a really, I was asked one time on a radio program, I was going, ah, da, da, da. I couldn't remember all of them. But I just, there are certain Bible characters that really stand out to me. And of course, well, yeah, I had extended women. that too. Yeah, like, you did. You, I got you. Know, you. That, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You know, that, I know that Zacchaeus wasn't a disciple. All right, yeah, but he was. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, if we, if we count that, so it can kind of pop open. But one of the ones that I think about, and I don't know that I always identify with him, but I think about it, and the list is Judas. I think, hmm, mm-hmm. and I don't like to think about him, but I think, how am I ever like him? It's kind of a check, and not yeah. a guilt trip thing, just a check in yeah, my heart. Yeah. For me, it's kind of split between Thomas mm. and John. Thomas, because I tend to question things, and uh, mm-hmm. that's not a very attractive characteristic uh, sometimes, but it's part of what I do sometimes. And uh, and the reason for John is because, as Daniel mentioned, as one of the sons of Zebedee, I mean, he wanted the top place, but also Jesus referred to him and his brother James as the sons of thunder, <laughs> which <laughs> seems to not be a very positive name to give him. But yet at the same time, even writing his gospel record 60 or so years after the events happened, he still had never gotten over the fact that Jesus loved him Mm -hmm. Uh, in spite of his thunder and in spite of his desire for promotion, in spite of any other failings he might have had along the way. He never got over the fact that Jesus loved him. And I think Mm -hmm. that, uh, that John is the one who's attributed 
with the authorship of this letter that we're looking at together in these conversations. Uh, in our Bibles, it's referred to as Third John. And one of the things Randy Richards told us when he was with us is when you have these letters, they're put in order based on length. So First John is the longest, Second John is the second longest, and Third John is the shortest, which I'd never even thought of that before, but I thought that was <laughs> kind of interesting. So when we look at Third John, it's interesting that his name never appears in the actual letter, which is very different from Paul, isn't it? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Paul always writes out, I, Paul. Yeah, he said, I sign my own name as mm-hmm. I do to all the letters that I write. Well, John didn't use his name in any of the letters he wrote but he referred to himself as the elder. So, Elisa, would you start us off by reading 3 John verse 1 and then drop down and pick up verses 13 through 15. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. And then in verse 13, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Now... The elder doesn't tell us that John is the author of this letter, but the earliest church traditions held that John had written these letters, and there's linguistic characteristics between these three letters that seem to signify that they were all written by the same person. So to accept that ancient tradition as it was and to uh, see him as the author is considered very normal and very acceptable. Mm. You may have some questions about that. I'm not an expert on Johannine authorship <laughs> of letters, but... Now, that's pretty fancy, Bill. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, I know how to say Johannine, but that's about as far as it goes. That reminds me, Bill, of just the fact that sometimes we get really tangled up in that, like trying to yeah. figure out exactly who wrote things. But the way it's presented to us in the scriptures is whether or not it's John himself or not, it's supposed to be read as if it's John. And so I think it's safe for us to work off of that assumption, especially mm-hmm. since none of us are textual critic experts or something like that, where we could dive into it more deeply. I have no problem whatsoever accepting John's authorship of these letters Mm -hmm. or the gospel that bears his name. But if we're going to assume him as the author, then let's talk a little bit about background of John. What do we see about him in the gospels as we're introduced to him? He's a fisherman too, right? Yep. He and his father and his brother. Right. Mm -hmm. He's also one of the pairs of brothers that followed Jesus, Andrew and Peter being the others and maybe like what you'd imagine from the rough and burly fishermen that they they had this nickname he and james his brother the sons of well the sons of zebedee what they were called but the sons of thunder yeah were their (laughs) nickname yeah and and what does that really mean you mentioned that earlier bill well it seems to have a connection if you'll remember when uh, the disciples and jesus came to a samaritan village and the village turned them away and they asked jesus if he wanted them to call down fire from heaven and destroy that (laughs) village Now, I don't know who considers that a rational response to (laughs) what they had experienced in the village, but it seems like there may be a connection between the Sons of Thunder and that kind of instant reaction of, okay, we're going to burn you down. One of the things we find out about John is that we believe he was one of the first two to follow Jesus. In John chapter 1, Jesus is baptized by John the baptizer, and John the baptizer, turns to two of his own disciples and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and then repeats it again, Behold the Lamb of God. And apparently Andrew and the other follower, who we believe to be John, took that as an indication that their time of following John the baptizer was over, and they went and followed Jesus. So they became the first two disciples to follow Jesus. And then it just continued from there. Andrew went and found his own brother, Simon. We assume that John went and found James and brought him, but we're not told about that encounter in the scriptures. Jesus went and found Philip and Philip brought Nathaniel. So that first little group of disciples would have been Andrew, John, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. And those would have been the ones who accompanied Jesus to Cana to the wedding where he performed his first miracle. That's a pop to think about John 
being first the disciple of John the Baptizer. So he had been already looking for truth, already in relationship with the one who would point to truth. And that makes him probably historically, you know, one of mm-hmm. the oldest faithful. Yeah, yeah. And he's not just a part of that first group of disciples, but he kind of becomes a part of Jesus's inner circle as well. Yeah. Peter, James, and John are often invited, whether it's on the Mount of Transfiguration or in other stories. It's like those are the three guys that Jesus has not a relationship that he doesn't have with others, but some kind of special connection with them or some reason for often inviting them close to him as he experiences different things. I think it was maybe G. Campbell Morgan or maybe William Barclay Daniel who theorized that maybe the reason Peter, James, and John were closest wasn't because Jesus had a closer bond with them, but maybe because they needed that the most of the Mm -hmm. other disciples. They're the ones that Jesus took with him to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. They're the ones he took with him deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane for the agony that he would experience there. And later on, they become three of the primary authors of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, One of the other things that I think is really interesting is that throughout the gospel records, we see Peter and Andrew, James and John, Peter and Andrew, James and John. We see them linked as the brothers. But then the night of the the Last Supper, Jesus sends Peter and John to go prepare Mm -hmm. the Passover feast. And that seems to trigger a new working relationship between them. And then when you get into the book of Acts, it's Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John. It's very interesting. That seems to be the pivotal moment that kind of broke up the brothers and brought Peter and John together. So let's talk a little bit about this title, Elder. I mean, I know that in many churches Mm -hmm. today, elders are part of the church government, the church polity. What do you think he's talking about by referring to himself as the elder? I think he is more referring to himself from like an, as we say, the OG, you know, like the (laughs) the elder statesman. Mm -hmm. At this point, he's been around, as Daniel mentioned, you know, or Annalisa, like the longest, right? And Mm -hmm. this is later in his life. Mm -hmm. So I think of it more from a seniority age thing than I do a position in a particular local body. Mm. Yeah, there's a little bit of division of thought on that. Uh, Some say exactly what you said, that it's really just talking about him. He's the old head. I mean, if we're right, and he's writing this 60 years after the events of the Gospels, then he's got to be in his 80s at least of people living at that moment. He was the only one who had been there and done that with Mm -hmm. Jesus, you know. And so that in itself and the age and the long tenure of living out his relationship with Christ would give him a seniority. Others see in it him kind of flexing his apostolic muscles a little bit. And I want you to just kind of keep that in the back of your mind, because when we get to one of the other characters in the story, we're going to see him really flex those apostolic muscles. So leading off by calling himself the elder, perhaps because he's the oldest and he's been there, but perhaps because he has apostolic authority that he's going to bring to bear on a situation in that church. It's still interesting as we've talked about already, that he chose to refer to himself by something other than his own name. Yeah, and I think that term apostolic can kind of feel overwhelming to us at times, but meaning that he was an eyewitness and spent time with Jesus. And so kind of the weight that that has as an eyewitness versus someone who only heard about Jesus which is kind of one of the primary criteria to be an apostle, is you had to have a a real-life experience with Jesus. And to center us in a timeline here, Bill, these letters came when in the timeline compared to like his vision in the book of Revelation? Had Was he on the Isle of Patmos when this happens or is this prior? Well, the simple answer is the scriptures don't tell us. <laughs> you know, anything we say would be speculation. But it's generally, I think, kind of believed that the gospel and the letters came at one point and then the Isle of Patmos came later. So this is before. So he's not necessarily saying I was an eyewitness and 
I am still an eyewitness of, of mm-hmm. the future revelation. So he's really standing on the, the historic relationship with yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, and it would surprise me if he was completely on the Isle of Patmos at that point, because as you read, Elisa, early on, mm-hmm. he's saying, I'm not going to write everything to you because I think I'm going to be able to come visit you and talk to you about this. Good point. And yeah. so if he was fully put on the Isle of Patmos as his final destination for He wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. He okay. wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> That's good. Know. Yeah, I guess I, one last thing is I was thinking about that question of elder. I wonder to what extent, especially in the ancient Near Eastern culture, like there isn't the dichotomy that we might have in terms of if you were an elder, an uh, older statesman with the type of respect and honor then you writing and making some observations would probably have the weight of an apostolic authority without it having to be necessarily like an officially Mm. prescribed title. Just the nature of who you are is enough to probably garner that type of respect and, and audience. That's good. So we've been looking at John and his history with Jesus and his background and all those things. And now he's the elder, and as elder, he has responsibility for churches and responsibility to help give direction and guidance and wisdom to those churches. And he's got some things he's concerned about. He's got some things he's excited about. But whatever those things are, he's going to write those out, and we're going to see what he has to say as we move forward. that background about the elder, Jesus' disciple, the Apostle John, is important for us to have in mind as we dig into this letter that he wrote and the message he was trying to get across. You're listening to Discover the Word with your friends Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry as they study the book of 3 John. Now, when you read the Bible, you often come across names of people that you don't know all that much about, if anything. And uh, sometimes we just skip over those, right? We've all done that. But next, we're going to dig into the life of a man who shared a close relationship with the Apostle John and is a big part of why the book of Third John is in the New Testament. He's a man named Gaius. And he's up next in our study, Four Men, Four Stories, right after we take this break. <laughs> Now, the team started out this edition of the podcast with a question. How do you read your Bible? Uh, Some of us read it as an instruction manual or a rule book, a theological text, or even a mystery. But as we heard them say, the Bible is a unified story about God and how he's interacted with people and how people have interacted with him. And to help you read your Bible well, We want to point you to a resource called What Every Christian Needs to Know About Reading the Bible. It's part of our Discovery Series, a collection of short, easy-to-read booklets from Our Daily Bread Ministries to help you engage the scriptures in a more meaningful way. You can read it online or you can listen to the audiobook. Simply search for What Every Christian Needs to Know About Reading the Bible at discoveryseries.org. It'd be a good introduction to our Discovery Series. There are about 150 different titles in that library, in addition to what every Christian should know about reading the Bible. That's at discoveryseries.org. And now, after talking about the writer, we're going to focus on the person that John was writing to. A man named Gaius enters the picture. And so let's get to know him better and start to get an idea of what John's message to him was. It's going to have something to do with love, because, I mean, that's just who John is. We're all familiar with the concept of speaking the truth in love, right? That's Ephesians 4.15. Mm-hmm. How does that present itself when you speak the truth in love? And is it easy to do? Oh, I'm, I'm going to all of the communication principles, you know, that you're supposed to give 10 attaboys for every negative because people can't hear that. Or you always start off with a positive and then you go to the negative. Or you use a formula like when you say... I feel about that blank, 
and therefore I think blank. I go to all those little formulaic mm. things you're supposed to do. I just start laughing because I <laughs> immediately hear all the times that I've heard somebody use that. But typically it's in a time when what they said did not feel loving. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, hey, I'm just speaking the truth in love. <laughs> it's like, like a yeah, cover up. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think about how challenging it is to actually do and how important it is mm-hmm. because in that Ephesians for passage is really talking about the unity of the church, the maturity, the way that we need Mm -hmm. each other Mm -hmm. and what will allow us to grow together. It's a practical challenge to speak Mm -hmm. the truth in love. And it's, I think whether it's easy or hard, I think you're right. It's a practical challenge, but I think it's ultimately rooted in whether or not the relationship is there. If I'm talking to someone with whom I have a really good relationship and we know how we feel about each other, and we know where we stand with one another, it's a lot easier to say hard things Mm -hmm. when the relationship is solid than it is to just walk up to somebody and, you know, say, hey, listen, you're out of line, man, you messed up. Because they don't know that you're saying the truth in love. All they know is that you're chewing them out. But Mm -hmm. when the relationship of love is already in place, I think that paves the way for truth to be able to live in that relationship as well. I so appreciate that, Bill and Russell, too. But what it's hitting me is we go straight to the negative with this phrase. I mean, you can speak the truth in love on you are a child of God. Uh, You are the beloved. God has an amazing call on your life. These are all positive things Mm -hmm. that are truth spoken in love. And so then what makes me think harder about this is the speaking the truth in love that we went to here is conflict. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly like conflict. So I'd rather stay on the happy side of you are God's child and you are the beloved and, you know, all those things. But the relationship really requires both truths, doesn't it? It it requires that we call out the goodness and also call out correction. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Elisa. And I think one of the places where this becomes difficult is, are we speaking truth or are we just reacting to a moment? Mm -hmm. Uh, Are we really certain about the situation and the truth of that situation? Or are we just seeing one little piece of data and then building an argument off of that? I think there are a variety of things in there that that we really need to be careful with because to be able to speak the truth in love may be one of the strongest keys to having a deep, meaningful relationship with anyone. Yeah, and it reminds me of when Jesus would say stuff like, they'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. Yeah. And so the way that we speak truth to each other can be different than the way that the world speaks, quote unquote, truth yeah. to one another. That's good, Daniel. Now, we started off in our first conversation, we said one of the things that John seems to be really committed to in his letters is balancing truth and love. And we're going to see that as he addresses the next character in this little letter. So Daniel, would you read 3 John verses 1 through 4? The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now, let me add verses five and six, because he continues addressing Gaius in those. He says, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they bear witness to your love before the church, and you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. You notice how many times the words love and truth pop up in those few verses? Mm. You can really tell what's on John's mind, can't you? And beloved. Yeah, the continuing call of Gaius is the beloved. Yeah, some translations translate it dear Gaius. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. one of the commentaries that I read said that dear is just not a strong enough (laughs) word to translate agapeto, which is the word beloved, because agapeto, of course, comes from agape, which is the highest form of love that there is. And it's the kind of love that God expressed to us by sending Jesus to the cross. So when we think about the richness of that word and the fact that not once, 
But over and over, John keeps using that word to describe Mm -hmm. this man, Gaius. It tells us a little bit about how he feels about him and the relationship that they have together. And that's an important word to John. You know, we've looked at it in other conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, John calls himself that beloved disciple. And then in the book of 1 John, he makes a huge point of the identity of the children of God as the beloved. Yeah, and that's kind of what makes it tricky, right, to know how close he is with Gaius, because in 1 John, it seems like a letter that's for a much broader audience than Mm -hmm. just one person, but he uses that word a lot to describe this group of people that he cares deeply for. And yet there also seems to be like a little extra love (laughs) between John and Gaius in the beginning of this, because it just feels like there's more context. Yeah, I think there's a sense in which he could address all of the congregation as beloved, because they're beloved of God. I think where it takes on that extra bump that you're talking about, Daniel, is when he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Mm -hmm. Now, to the, the fact of being beloved, which could mean beloved of God, now he adds his own love and appreciation as well. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, too, I noticed Lisa's point that in this context, speaking the truth and love so far is all about edifying and speaking Mm -hmm the truth of how God sees who Gaius is and what is true Mm -hmm. about the community. This is all supportive. And it just made me think about how important I think that is for us to do today. How often can I find opportunities to just edify someone with how I talk about them and what I see is true in them. He mentions the fact that when the brothers came and testified, they were encouraged and, and that that was a good thing. So he's a really encouraging guys. And I think that's something mm-hmm. that is a model for us. Yeah, I think part of what he's commending him for is that he is prospering spiritually, which I would assume means that he's growing and developing and maturing spiritually. He also commends him because he's walking in truth. Mm -hmm. And then he commends him, as you mentioned, Rasul, for the hospitality Mm -hmm. that he had shown to others who had come in. And they went away saying, wow, we were well cared for. Mm -hmm. Gaius was the one who really seemed to be the one who was taking care of that. And I just think that you put all those things together. There's a spiritual aspect of that. There's kind of a theological aspect of that, but there's also a very practical aspect of that. And all three of those become things that John is commending him for. And I do think it's interesting that even though he loves Gaius, clearly, he doesn't love Gaius because he does all those things. He loves Gaius, and he loves that Gaius does all these things. I think it's interesting that he says... I pray that in all respects you will prosper and be in good health. Was that a, mm-hmm. a common greeting kind of thing, or do you think Gaius might have been in poor health? One of the commentaries I read, it mentioned that their blessing on someone's health was a part of ancient letters. Mm-hmm. And so that part isn't necessarily what stands out. What stood out to that commentator was the fact that he then relates it to, I wish you health for your Mm. body as the healthiness I see in your soul, which is a really fascinating idea. There's something about Gaius' soul that is so healthy that he's like, man, I I pray that even your body experiences the kind of health that your soul has experienced, which is really interesting. That is good, Daniel. Yeah. Let's add another little twist to that, Daniel, because I think that's really good. I think at a most basic practical level. It shows a holistic concern for his friend. Not only is he concerned for his spiritual growth and development, but he's also concerned for his physical welfare. And I think, again, we see as John is balancing truth and love, here he's also balancing the practical, physical, and the spiritual, balancing those interests and concerns as well. Mm -hmm. The one thing we know for sure is that he likes this guy, (laughs) and he appreciates him, and he respects him. He's going to lean into that friendship to call him to help with something here in our next conversation. Yeah, helpful conversation there, introducing us to Gaius, a good friend of the Apostle John, whose presence is crucial to the effectiveness of this letter that John wrote. That's part of our New Testament as 3rd John. Well, that's two, John and Gaius, two of the four men, four stories of 3rd John. And now in this next segment, we come to the first of what Bill called earlier the two Ds, a man named Diotrephes. And as we'll see, he is the reason why they're talking about bullies 
and bullying to start this next part of the conversation. Have you ever been bullied? Yes, definitely. In school, I was on the smaller side, and especially when I went to a new school. Yeah, you know, you had folks that would uh, kind of target and pick on the little ones. Mm. So I experienced that. Yeah. When I was um, hmm, probably in my 30s, I had an interview downtown Denver for a television news program thing, and I parked in the wrong place. And when I got out, there was a car behind mine hemming me in. And I went into the office there and said, who's parked behind me? Anyway, it was a man, a a lawyer, and he was in his 70s. And he just said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And Mm. you just have to wait till I'm willing to move my car. And that whole situation made me shrink down to feel like a (laughs) five-year-old. And um, it was a power play. Yeah. It was scary. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being bullied at times in school as well. And just feeling like I was on the outside a lot, especially in elementary and middle school in particular. (laughs) Just how hard that is when you feel alone and that the only interactions you have with some people are negative ones where they're saying something mean or doing something mean or whatever. So I've definitely experienced that. Um, I have as well. And some of it was when I was back in school as a kid. And a lot of it, when you begin to understand the psychology of bullying, a lot of it's about them trying to make themselves big by making you small. Mm -hmm. A lot of bullying, I think, is an expression of a person's insecurities. And so the way they overcome that is by making somebody else less secure than they are. And I went through it. We had a kid on our street. Uh, His name was David. Their family did not seem to be a really good, cohesive kind of family unit. There's a lot of friction and fighting and and stuff going on. And he kind of took all of that friction in his home and visited it on the heads of the kids on the street like me. And it was really, as you said, it's very intimidating It also makes you feel weak. It makes you feel small. It makes you feel less than, all of those things. And that's part of what makes it so crippling and why there's so much speaking out today against bullying, because I think people are really beginning to understand the long-term ramifications, both of the bully and the bullied Mm -hmm. in both cases. Now, let me push that one step further. Have you ever been bullied in church? I've been bullied in the sense, and I would maybe expand this to not just church, but like in the church, capital C, meaning with Christians, in the sense of somebody having a right perspective in their mind Mm -hmm. that they disagreed with me and the language that they used to communicate that to me was how wrong I was or far away from God or something like that, where it was a very made me feel all the same things that I felt in middle school or in elementary school Mm -hmm. when it felt othering and pushing away and stuff like that. And if I'm honest, I've probably been that person too in church settings as well, where I've had such a strong opinion of what I thought was true Mm. that I wasn't loving as Mm -hmm. well. So that one I might have uh, been on both sides of. I think if we're honest And if we thought back far enough, we could all find cases where we were on either side of that coin. And I think that's a really good check, Daniel. But it gives me some comfort to know that John was bullied too. Mm -hmm. John, the beloved apostle, was bullied. And we're going to hear him talk about it in the next section of 3 John. So, Rasul, would you like to read verses 9 and 10 for us? I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first among them... (laughs) does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Wow. Okay. I can guarantee you that for every pastor and church leader listening to this program right now, there's a face hovering right in front of you of your <laughs> personal diatrophies. Remember in an earlier program when we were trying to sort out John's use of the term elder, and was it just seniority and age, or was it kind of apostolic flexing his muscles? This is where I think he flexes his muscles apostolically. So what are the characteristics of this diatrophies character? Oh. 
Wow, he loves to be first among the mm, church. <laughs> yeah, can't relate to that at all. <laughs> yeah, the King James said, who loves to have preeminence among mm. the brothers. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to, I want to sit at your right and left, which yeah. is interesting for John to be upset about. Isn't that he interesting? he himself asked for yeah. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe he knows where that path mm-hmm. leads, and he, mm-hmm. he's a little concerned for diatrophies as well. Mm-hmm. But notice how far this extends. Notice it extends to him accusing John with wicked words, it says. Mm -hmm. That's where John is being bullied. Yeah. John, the beloved apostle, is being bullied by Diotrephes. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren. And the brethren here seems to be speaking of itinerant preachers, kind of like some of the guys that Paul traveled with that he would send out different places to preach, Mm -hmm. that when they would come to this congregation to present uh, their teaching, he wouldn't allow them in. Diotrephes would not allow them in, and anybody who tried to let him in, he would kick them out of the church. So this guy clearly has some control issues, among other things. Yeah. He just sounds like a really troubled soul. Mm. And it sounds like such a modern story, Yeah, right? Like there are so many places that we see in modern Christianity, whether it's a church or a ministry setting or something, where there's someone that has a perspective on things that they feel is the right perspective yeah, and they defend it and they push others away and they don't let anybody speak up against them in any way or against what they believe or whatever. I just feel like, you know, sometimes in the Bible we run across stories where it's hard to relate to them. And this just feels really easy <laughs> to relate to because it just feels like feels like something that we could be reading about so-and-so speaker down the street or ministry or even ourselves at yeah. times. Notice also it says in verse 9, the very first verse of this section, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes does not accept what mm-hmm. we say. It makes you wonder what it was that John wrote to the church <laughs> <laughs> and what it was about it that caused this character Diotrephes to react against it so harshly so that now John has to write this letter to the church and this time he addresses it to Gaius because he knows that it'll get attention if it goes to him rather than going through the normal channels. Hmm. One thing I think about is the contrast between the personality and the instructions of John who has such a humility that he doesn't even like to mention his name, you know, when he's writing Hmm. and is enamored by this aspect of Jesus's love for him, the importance and centrality of love in terms of how we engage with each other. In our earlier conversation, we talked about that in his relationship with Gaius and just how drenched in this aspect of the beloved. And when I think about people who are bullies, who intimidate, uh, that's a much different point of reference. It's about power. It's about Mm -hmm. control. Yeah. And we see that in the description of Diotrephus's actions, right, of deciding who can be in and who can be out. Anybody associated with John, he wants to keep out. Mm. And I think that that is something that it reminds me when Jesus said, do not lord over authority like the Gentiles. And yeah. yet there's a sense in which that is the tendency of the bully. Yeah. Think about it another way, because I think you're really spot on there, Russell. Mm. Think about all of the positive things he just said about Gaius, and now put that in contrast to the things that he said about Diotrephes. Mm -hmm. That is shocking, Mm -hmm. because we've been talking about truth and love. Well, we see a lot of love with Gaius, with mentions of truth sprinkled in, but now he's bringing the truth against Diotrephes and his conduct and his actions and his attitude. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to know how Diotrephes responds to this. You know, we don't have that. Yeah, we don't. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to know if Diotrephes is doing all this because he just wants control and power or if that's a blind spot in his life and he's one of those that thinks he's protecting this little church or whatever it is or this community of believers and he thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong and he's the one with the God-given perspective and right like this could be a major blind spot for him too or because I think that's where I would relate to him more than I want to admit is those times when I'm just so confident that I have the right perspective and how easy it is in those moments to push away mm-hmm. other people's perspectives or other mm-hmm. people's ideas. So I'd be really curious, like, just to know, is this a guy with a major blind spot that doesn't even know that he's this power hungry and acting this way? And then how does he respond when he hears I this I think from you, guys? you're onto something. You know, you go on into verse 11 and the letter is written 
not to Diotrephes. You know, it, I mean, he's mentioned there, mm-hmm. but it's written beloved. And, you know, so he, he calls out Diotrephes to the whole group. And then in 11, he says, so don't imitate what's evil, but what's good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil is not seeing God. So it's like he's saying, don't let him get away with this. And you don't fall into this same Mm -hmm. pattern yourself. So I don't know how Diotrephes responded. You're right. But, you know, the elder John is lifting him up as an example of what we're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And how would you have liked to have been in the service when this letter was read (laughs) to the church and Diotrephes (laughs) is sitting there and all of a sudden John directs the attention of the whole congregation on this one guy. And it sounds like he's tried to tell him in other ways and it hadn't worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, we don't know, like you said, Daniel, we don't know how he responded to these statements in the letter. I think if he is a typical bully, his first reaction would be defensiveness. Mm-hmm. Since for a bully, it's about promoting self. Anything that's going to knock me down, I've got to push against that. And so just based on what we know about human nature and things like that, it would be easy to imagine that kind of a scenario. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe he's like so many of the scribes and Pharisees who we look at as such evil villains, but many of them, it seems, when you dig into the history and the stories of the scriptures, many of those guys, they really genuinely thought they were defending Judaism. And that's a hard thing for us to get our minds around sometimes. I'd like to try to maybe complicate that on both sides good on the one end i do think that there's a certain type of premeditation involved unjustly accusing us with wicked words is a type of slander that is intentional Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time similar to the pharisees with jesus like there's that one point where they jumped the shark right where it's like when lazarus is resurrected and they're like Mm -hmm. okay now we got to kill lazarus and jesus like (laughs) at some point now you've going beyond yourself. And yet I would say there is something about our own humanity that can cause us to want to justify our actions. So to the point where we end up selling out our own stated or explicit values. And I think that that's where I can see both the red line that goes, okay, Diotrephus is is way out there. Like I, I do think that this is an intentional bully who's trying to use his power to, to control. And yet at the same time, there is something about us that is a warning there that we can go in that same direction if we're not mindful about why we are doing the things that we do. And I think that that's a, a great a warning yeah. to us all. Yeah, again, it's that reminder that if we have a situation where we need to speak truth to make sure that we speak the truth in love genuinely, not just as a cover for whatever we feel like saying at that time. And I think that you're right. I think it's real easy for us to go down that path and suddenly find ourselves fighting against all the things that once we stood for. Dealing with bullies and being a bully ourselves. Unfortunately, we've probably had experience in both of those areas. And so that's why Third John speaks into our lives today with such surprising clarity. You're listening to Discover the Word with Bill Crowder, Elisa Morgan, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And in the final part of our study, Four Men, Four Stories in Third John, we'll be introduced to a man named Demetrius, who highlights an important message contained in this letter that John wrote. It just reminds me how much life is a group project and following <laughs> mm-hmm. Christ is a group project. And sometimes in our individualistic society, we can get lost when we think that somehow I don't need the church. I don't need community. I can just kind of do that on my own. Yeah. I need other people to help me walk with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that full conversation follows a quick preview of our next Discover the Word podcast. This is how Daniel begins the next episode of the Discover the Word podcast. All right, I just want to read part of a verse and have you respond to it. I'm not going to give any context, just part of a verse. And then if you'll just share kind of where this takes you in your heart and mind. So here it goes. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. What goes through your head 
And how does that make you feel? Hmm, how does that make you feel? Ever been there? And so what does Daniel want to do in a series about eating the bread of anxious toil? Yeah, so take all of that emotion, thoughts, all of those feelings you have, and bring those with you as we journey this week. Uh, We're going to look for specifically that word toil throughout the scriptures. And I think what we'll find is that that word toil, first of all, it shows up a lot, but it kind of helps tell the story of the Bible. Yeah, perspective shaping conversation about the bread of anxious toil. Don't miss the next Discover the Word podcast. And now the fourth of the four men, four stories in 3 John. Have you ever been challenged to follow someone's example? I mean, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the answer's got to be Jesus here, right? (laughs) Well, and, and that's true. But I mean, you think about it in terms of the scriptures. Paul said, imitate me Mm -hmm. as I imitate Jesus. Yeah. If we're going to have an example, we better make sure we're following the right examples, right? And I don't know if I'd have those guts to say that. No, (laughs) I know. know. Hey, hey, Rasul, just act like me because I'm acting like Jesus. Yeah, Yeah, because I got it down. Yeah. Yeah. But I think of the concept of mentoring, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think, yeah, I mean, there are people who I think I'd like to emulate. Mm -hmm. So in that way. Yeah. Yeah, there was a very clear moment for me. My um, first job out of college, I was an intern teacher. I didn't have a education degree, so they paired me in the classroom with a certified teacher who was Mm -hmm. amazing, Mm -hmm. one of the most organized people I've ever met. However, she was pregnant and was about to go on maternity leave in November, right? So school starts in September. And after she left, I was essentially the (laughs) primary teacher. So I was Mm -hmm. absorbing everything (laughs) that she was doing, hoping to live close as I could to the example that she gave. That's challenging. Yeah, 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 that is challenging. For me, I think back to older men who mentored me in ministry. Again, what you were mentioning, Elisa, about mentoring and things like that. And then I think about young people that we mentored in our church who were studying for ministry in Bible colleges or seminaries, and they'd come and they would be on paid staff of the church for the summer so that they could learn how to do ministry in kind of that environment uh, where where stuff was going on. And again, I have to confess that not always was the example we were giving those young men and women, not always was it the best. I'm thankful for everything they learned that was good, and I hope they forgot everything else. (laughs) Uh, Because all of us are a mix of our best intentions and our worst inclinations. That's a good phrase, Bill. That's worth repeating. (laughs) A mix of our best intentions and our worst inclinations. Yeah. That's good. The mentor (laughs) and the anti-mentor. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, everything's an example of either good or bad, and we need to learn from both, but there's only one that we follow and imitate, uh, and that's hopefully the good. In our last conversation, we saw John taking to task the church bully, sort of, as we talked Mm -hmm. about him. And that may be an unfair characterization as we talked about. Maybe this was a blind spot, as you said, Daniel. Maybe he didn't realize what he was doing, or maybe his intentions were good, but his actions were not good. But it's almost as if in response to having said that, now John wants to say, now let me give you a better example to follow. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And he talks about the fourth and final character. So, Elisa, would you read verses 11 and 12 of Third John 4? Sure. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony And you know that our testimony is true. Yeah, so he says, don't imitate what's evil, but what is good. And the one who does good is of God. And Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. So you can see he's building an argument here. If you need an example to follow, it's not Diotrephes. Mm -hmm. Look at Demetrius and see his example. That's the one to follow. There's some interesting phrases in here. But again, the word imitate is such a huge word. That's the word that Paul used to say, 
imitate me even as I imitate Christ, you know? I mean, that's Mm -hmm. a huge word. What are the implications of that? Well, the really good news in that for those of us who feel called to imitate is it doesn't mean we have to get it all right at the beginning (laughs) because the whole point is we're maybe not naturally living in such a way where we look like Jesus. Mm -hmm. But by imitating, we can begin practicing something that may not be fully true for ourselves yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, that's a really good invitation is the fact that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to try, I'm going to follow the example of this person. And then slowly over time, hopefully that sticks in such a way that it actually transforms who I am. And I am like Christ. So are you saying fake it till you make it? <laughs> Sometimes that's Sometimes. what that's a little spiritual formation, right? As long as we're honest when we don't make it yeah. as well. Yeah. Right? And you know, this is a tender thing too. I'm I'm processing our conversation about mentors, good and bad ones. John has pointed out that Diotrephes is a bad example, but isn't it tender of him to understand our humanity to need a human good example? I mean, mm-hmm. yes, we, we, it's much easier to say, just follow Jesus, just imitate Jesus, but we still, we don't get to see him. And in our bodies of believers, we only see him through people. You know, that's yeah. how mm-hmm. we interpret it. And so even in this first century, John is going, don't be like Diotrephes, be like Demetrius. I know you need a concrete example of what I'm talking about. And, and yeah. that just feels very tender to me. Yeah. You know what I find really interesting, and I just thought about this while you were talking, Elisa, is... He says, don't follow the example of Diotrephes, follow the example of Demetrius. But he does not say, don't follow the example of Diotrephes, follow my example. Mm. He doesn't say what Paul says. And again, Mm. that may go back in an earlier conversation, Uh, Rasul, you talked about the spirit of humility that we sense Mm. in John. John. Mm -hmm. And that may be part of that as well. He's not willing to put himself out there as the imprimatur of faith. But he is willing to push Demetrius to the front and say, you want to see what it looks like? Watch this guy. And I think there's something really good in that. There's a real danger when we make ourselves the heroes of our own stories all the time. And for for him to not feel the need to promote himself as the example, but to promote Demetrius instead, I think is kind of healthy, actually. Yeah. And to me, the other thing it draws out is the proximity maybe that Demetrius had to community and the importance yeah. of mm-hmm. community as well. Like mm-hmm. John appeals to both what is just right and wrong, good and evil. He says, mm-hmm. don't imitate yeah. evil, imitate good. There's something objective out there where you could be doing the wrong thing. Don't do that. So that's one layer. And then he, you know, appeals to God more specifically. He says, okay, do what God would have us to do. But then he then draws the example of a particular, as Elisa said, flesh and blood person to say, and then look like this mm. because he has a good testimony from everyone, including me. Hmm. And you know, my testimony is true. It just reminds me how much life is a group project and following <laughs> yeah. Christ is a group project. And sometimes in our individualistic society, we can get lost when we think that somehow I don't need the church. I don't need community. I can just kind of do that on my own. Yeah. And here's the apostle John who of anybody, he's at this point in time, he probably had spent more time with Jesus in person than anybody else on the planet. And he still is appealing to our need for contextual communal examples and experience Mm. of the body together. And I think that that's something that, I take away from that is is still important. I I need Mm -hmm. other people to help me walk with Jesus. That's good. Yeah, that's really helpful. I don't know that I've thought of that before, but yeah, perhaps Demetrius is the person, like maybe the reason John doesn't say imitate me, imitate Demetrius is Demetrius is the actual person that's in the context of Gaius that Gaius could get Uh a relationship with. And how powerful would that be for those of us that feel separated from people that we care about? If we were able to tell them like, hey, back in our hometown, I know I'm not there anymore, but you know who's just like really killing it and who just loves, (laughs) loves the Lord and is is just like a great, Mm -hmm. amazing person. You should spend more time with so-and-so because they're like, man, I wish I could spend more time with so-and-so. Like that would be a very powerful way to encourage someone in our lives. And I think all of us have people in our backgrounds that have had that kind of influence on us and that we would really long for them to have that kind of influence on people we care about as Mm, well. Yeah. 
As we kind of wind this down, let's just review quickly who are the four characters we've seen in this brief little letter. First is John, the elder. I love how he always says he's the beloved, and he calls yeah. everybody else the beloved. I mean, he is so solid on that and wants everybody to know they're the beloved. And then we have Gaius, someone that he encourages by speaking the truth and love in a way in which he really builds them up and mm -hmm. lets them know how much he appreciates and others appreciate who Gaius is. Yeah. And then uh, Diotrephes, who is our anti-mentor in the story <laughs> and is the one offering not a good example. And unfortunately, someone that all of us have somebody in our lives that he represents all too well. And if we're honest, represents us sometimes far too well. Yeah. And then in this conversation, we saw Demetrius, who was an example worth following. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we look at these four people, I mean, I was a pastor for over 20 years. I pastored three churches in three different regions of the country. And I can tell you, I saw these four kinds of people in all those churches. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know really how to measure that. Or if you want to say classify it, that sounds a little impersonal, but about 40 years ago, and this will let you know how much of an impact it had on me because I remember it 40 years later. 40 years ago, I read an article in Leadership Magazine. It was an interview with Gordon McDonald, who was a pastor in the Northeast and very influential. And he said that in every church, there are four kinds of people. The four kinds of people, he said, are the VIPs, the VTPs, the VNPs, and the VDPs. He said the VIPs are the leaders, and that's about 5% of the church population. He said the VTPs are very teachable people, and they're kind of the leaders in training. The VNPs are the very nice people. And he said usually that's the larger part of the congregation. And he said... They aren't going to really help out a whole lot or anything, but they're nice. They're nice to have around. They're just nice people. And then he said the VDPs were the very draining people. <laughs> they were the ones who just sucked the life right out of you. <laughs> so he said the VIPs were about 5%. The VTPs were about 15%. The VNPs were about 75%, and that leaves about 5% for the VDPs. And I think, you know, if we kind of let it be real flexible and malleable, you could see John the Elder as the VIP, <laughs> the leader. Gaius, kind of a leader in training. He's kind of talking him through how to handle these situations. Mm -hmm. Diotrephes the bully is the VDP, the very mm, draining, draining person. Mm -hmm. And Demetrius is probably more honorable than to call him just a, a nice guy. Uh, he's got mm -hmm. more going on than just that, but still, he is at least that. I think, you know, our tendency when we look at something like that is to maybe look around in our churches and see who fits in what categories. But maybe the place to, where we can leave this off is to ask ourselves, which category would we land in? Are we an example to be followed like Demetrius? Are we the anti-example like Diotrephes? Are we someone who's really seeking to be used of the Lord and being prepared for that? Are we someone he's already using in some kind of a leadership role? How does God want to write us into his story as he wrote these into the story of the scripture? a great question and a great way to wrap up the conversation called Four Men, Four Stories here on the Discover the Word podcast. Your study partners for this study of 3rd John have been Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And thanks for remembering that your financial gifts help cover the cost of providing Discover the Word and all of the other resources from Our Daily Bread Ministries to people all over the world. It's not an exaggeration that millions around the globe access our materials. And so please make a one-time donation or maybe consider giving monthly as a Discover the Word partner. When you go online to discovertheword.org, click the Donate tab and explore your options. 
Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedding. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.